I'm very happy to introduce Robin Lomstein, who is going to be our, our first speaker. So uh, Robin, for those of you who don't know, Robin has a long, illustrious career. She got a PhD at Harvard like a couple of years ago. And then uh, from there, she went on to Princeton, Brown as professors. Then she did a stint at Deutsche Bank. She worked for the Federal Reserve Board. And uh, as of now, she's a distinguished professor at America at American University in Washington, DC. And she also has a joint appointment with uh, Erasmus in Rotterdam. And I think, I understand she spends like half, half or something to that effect. Uh, so Robin's work has also done a sort of varied in a, in a lot of different areas, okay? Uh, some of her earlier work that she's well known for in her earlier part of her career was, was about aging and, and health. And she's done very important influential work on that. Uh, she also has some very well cited paper early in her career on unit roots and test for unit roots. She's done uh, work on financial market integration too. Uh, more recently, she's worked on, uh, on banking and regulation, which I think is somewhat related to what we're going to hear a little bit about today. Uh, now, Personally, also, I actually remember my, my sort of history with Robin goes, goes way back. So uh, I remember first meeting Robin when she, she was a, a PhD student. Uh, she was a PhD student at Harvard, but she was actually visiting the uh, University of Chicago. And at the time, I was an assistant professor at Northwestern, uh, which is it's not exactly down the road, but it's not that far from, from University of Chicago. And, uh, and, and one of the things that Robin was also working on at that time was uh, testing in, in, in GARS models. So, so uh, I remember Robin came to Northwestern and, and we talked and, and she visited with me a couple of times and, uh, and she has, uh, in, that, in that vein, she has, uh, I think, the, the first paper that sort of really formally establishes asymptotic normality of, uh, of uh, MLE and, and, and QMLE in, in, in guard settings uh, and uh, that's also a very highly cited paper. Uh, but that's not what we're going to hear about today. So today we're going to shift gear again and we're going to hear about uh, policy communications and, and public perceptions. One thing I do want to say now that I didn't mention but mind myself on here. I think it, it's, it's, it's really great we have Robin here because this being a Sophie thing, Robin has really done a tremendous amount of work for Sophie through the years. She's always been extremely engaged in Sophie and, and, and really has been kind of a driving force in, in what Sophie has become. And uh, also, sort of very concretely, over the last few years, he's actually been our treasurer. But uh, with that, let's hear about policy, policy communications and, uh, and public perceptions. Robin. Thank you, Tim, for that lovely introduction. And let me just say how pleased I am to be here, particularly to open this phase of the, the conference, the post-conference, uh, for the early career scholars. This is a very important part of what, uh, what Sophie does and what Sophie's committed to. The people here and the papers we'll hear later on today are really the future uh, of, of this profession, and it's really great to be here, and so it's an honor uh, to be opening this. Um, I also should say, actually, that Sophie uh, was, was just starting out when I came back to academia, having left academia, and what I found was an incredibly welcoming community, and it has continued to be that, and so uh, I'm grateful for that, and it's, it was, Tim uh, was, was a bit modest in, in, uh, in, in his remarks and not mentioning that he was the president uh, of Sophie very recently, and it was a pleasure, it's been a pleasure, and continues to be a pleasure to work with him. Um, so the topic I want to talk about today is, is a topic that I've been interested in uh, for quite a while, and then actually probably dates back to my days in the private sector, where I was, like many private sector people, a, a Fed watcher. Uh, so we were very focused on the communications that the Federal Reserve was, uh, was making, um, and in particular, I covered the inflation-linked bond markets, and so was very focused on uh, anything to do with inflation and monetary policy. Um, but it then continued on in my days at the Fed uh, in the run-up to the financial crisis, and I think that was where, as we started to see deterioration in, um, in the banking sector, I wondered, and I was involved in some you know, of the communications related to that, I often wondered whether what we were seeing and what we knew from data how that related to what the public perception was, um, and recognizing that if there was a disconnect between uh, data and perception, uh, that that could lead to unintended uh, consequences. Uh, so with that to start, I have now what I use as my standard disclaimer, which is the views and opinions expressed are mine alone. They don't reflect my co-authors, nor any official positions of any of the institutions that I am or was affiliated with. Um, so, so I wanted to talk, start off a little bit just by asking the question, 
Why do we care about central bank talk? And I think one of the key things is that central banks tend to provide quite a lot of information, um, and not just related to data, but in terms of their communications. Um, quote by Ben Bernanke, monetary policy is 98% talk and 2% action. Um, and there's a lot of uh, very specific examples where central bank talk can be very effective without, uh, without any supporting action. So a, a very well-known example is Mario Draghi's whatever it takes remark uh, in the, during the, the beginning of the financial crisis uh, that really helped to kind of stabilize uh, the markets, calm the markets a little bit. Um, there's been a lot of, and, and, and the central banks around the world have various approaches to explaining monetary policy decisions. Uh, usually they have what's known as a policy statement, um, and these policy statements are, are very short, um, brief remarks that basically introduce what they've decided to do, um, and those are usually updated only marginally from meeting to meeting. So in particular, financial market participants uh, use things like track changes with these side-by-side -side statements uh, to compare the policy statement. And so at some level, the policy statements don't actually provide very much information about what policymakers are thinking or what their plans are. Um, and so that has uh, led to, and, and so basically there's a lot more documents than just the policy statement that we have to draw from and to draw inference from. So because of that, there's been, and, and because of uh, developments in, um, in, in, in science, there's been a lot of interest in textual analysis and, and natural language processing. Um, and one of the, and so that's what I want to talk about today is some of the work that I've been doing in that space. Uh, but one of the things about natural language processing and textual analysis, and I know some people in this audience are working on that, um, is that there's basically a lot of jargon. And, and so there's a, a bit of a barrier to entry uh, for people who are interested in thinking about textual analysis. Uh, and so I just wanted to give a, a tiny uh, two slide introduction just uh, to get everybody on the same page regarding uh, the language. So, so basically, when we think about analyzing text, we start off with the, the, the data set that we're going to use is the set of text itself. So that's a set of documents, and that's commonly referred to as the corpus. And the number of unique words in that corpus is what we refer to as the vocabulary. And so each set of text can be represented as a vector of words, um, and that vector is going to be equal to the length of the entire vocabulary in the corpus. So after we represent these texts as vectors, we can then use these vectors like we do vectors of data uh, for, for things like word searches, topic analysis, for all kinds of metrics that we can run along uh, with, with uh, related to these vectors. Now, one of the common approaches to, to dealing with these vectors um, is using latent Dirichlet allocation. And so this is a model that's basically a, a static model. It takes what they call a bag of words approach. So you think about all of the words in the corpus, all the words in the vocabulary, being thrown into a giant bag. You're drawing words from this bag, and you're trying to basically characterize the probability that you get a certain word when you draw it from this bag. You can introduce some limited dynamics um, by, for instance, estimating over, say, yearly sets of text. So you just have you know, yearly bags instead of all the bags uh, from the whole uh, vocabulary uh, to see whether it's the same topics occur in the speeches over years, and if, if so, how they evolve. Um, but there's a couple of important assumptions in LDA, which which also make it a bit limiting for some of the textual um, uh, things that we want to do. So one is that the set of text is associated with a fixed number of topics, and each document exhibits a mixture of these topics. So for instance, it doesn't really easily admit the possibility that some topic that we didn't know existed, like the COVID pandemic, is suddenly you know, part of um, the topics that we should be searching over in the entire corpus. Um, so the main challenge with LDA is that we're trying to infer these sort of latent topic word and document topic distributions from the observed words. Here's a visual picture of how it works. This is just a piece of a Federal Reserve speech from December 2008. Um, we've pre-identified that there's four topics. Uh, the topics don't have any specific um, theme associated with them, but of these four topics, you can see on the left here, this is the, the probability of the proportions that are in this document. The topics are associated with specific types of words, and then we can color the document to highlight where the topics appear uh, in the document. And so it's these topic proportions uh, and probabilities that we tend to use to analyze, uh, and, and we use them for predicting. So once we have the vector of these probabilities, we can then uh, use that vector in, in our standard sort of time series models uh, to think about predicting the, the next words or the words that will come out in, in future documents. So, my early work related to uh, policy communication exploited or used these LDA topics. And that resulted in two very early papers, one 
uh, was what say they about their mandate, a textual analysis of Federal Reserve speeches with Mirta Van uh, Dyen, who, is, who was a PhD student at Erasmus uh, University. Um, and that one, in that one, we assessed, we, we looked at Federal Reserve speeches. Um, the second one, which was actually uh, presented by my co-author, uh, Jacinia, at, at Sophie in Shanghai, when she was a student, uh, we looked at shifts in ECB communication. The main questions that we had in the first paper um, were the following. So one was, has there been a shift in the weights that are placed on the dual mandate goals of maximum employment and stable prices? And if so, has this changed? So again, this was looking at Federal Reserve speeches. Uh, the second one was, and this was in the aftermath of the financial crisis, has the Fed added, either de jure or de facto, uh, financial stability to its mandate? And to answer those questions, we investigated 1,100-ish speeches that were delivered by members of the Board of Governors of the Fed between 1997 and 2016. Um, and one of the key things about using speeches as opposed to transcripts or, um, or minutes or even the statements is that these speeches are in, available in real time um, or within minutes of the delivery and they're vetted extensively. Right? So there's a lot of care that goes into what goes into those speeches. Um, and the text analysis methods that we employed map the change in the Fed's perception of its responsibilities over time. The second paper introduced a bit of dynamics um, and that asked what, the, the two questions it asked were, what are the main communication patterns in the ECB press conference? And then do shifts in that communication pattern uh, affect stock market volatility on the governing council meeting days? Um, the, the steps in the analysis, we start off, we you know, again have to take that uh, corpus of all the ECB press conference uh, documents. We split that into sections. We analyze each section separately, so in that case, uh, the corpus um, uh, was comprised of all the sections in the documents. We used LDA uh, to then identify the topics, plot the rise and fall of the topic, and then we do these event-based regressions. This is just a, a picture that visually shows how these topics evolve over time uh, for four of the sections in the ECB policy statement. And remember that LDA is a bag of words, right? So there's nothing that imposes any chronology in the identification of the topics, but yet you can see that topics clearly sort of emerge and wane uh, over time. The other thing that's very striking about these pictures is in the bottom corner here, um, that's the Q&A section. And so the Q&A section is really the unscripted part of the ECB statement. And you can clearly see the structural break that happens in the transition uh, from Frise to Draghi, to Mario Draghi. So with that background, I now want to tell you about the, the, the new projects that I'm working on. So a little bit of background to these new projects, um, and, and part of the reason I wanted to highlight this is I think you know some of the both of these projects came out uh, during the pandemic, and I know for many people it was a struggle um, to to make the transition to the online environment. Um, you know we we all know how happy we are to be back here in person at Sophie, um, and and I think it's important to illustrate that um, you know at, at some level when life gives you lemons you make lemonade, and so you know coming out of this. Um, there, there was a good thing that came out of this conference. So in November 2020, the Bank of Italy and the Fed uh, had a conference, an online conference on non-traditional data and statistical learning with applications to macroeconomics. Um, I watched online two very interesting and terrific papers. Uh, one is by Angelico Marcucci, Macaulay, and Quarta, um, who showed that the social network Twitter can be used to elicit inflation expectations for Italy. And another one was by uh, Christoph Bursch, um, and, uh, and, um, and two co-authors, uh, and uh, Isaiah Hull and, and Jin uh, Zhang, who examined the organization of business cycle narratives around the dominant topic. Uh, and they find that the, these narratives consolidate during expansions and they fragment during contractions. And they particularly also found that narratives were more likely to become ordered when there was a past reference event. At that conference, I also gave the paper, uh, the Fed paper with Mirta um, that I mentioned earlier. So one of the things that was great about this conference is they had open chat. And so as people presented, we were chatting about the papers uh, that they had given. That resulted in, in conversations with all of these co-authors um, and has now resulted in these two papers that I have. So I've never actually met my co-authors in person, but I know them well because we've been communicating online ever since. And, uh, and that was a, a terrific out outcome. Um, so. I want to tell you a little bit about the first paper, and these are brand new, and I think you know, one of the things that's important at conferences is it's really great to be able to present uh, relatively new work where you can get uh, feedback um, as, and that, that can help to shape uh, 
uh, papers and, and help them to evolve. Uh, so this first um, project is, is, is really quite new. Uh, thanks to my co-authors, Sabina Marchetti and, and Juri Marcucci for, for uh, rallying a little bit uh, to, to, uh, in preparation for, for this talk. Um, but what we're going to do is following the earlier paper that, that uh, Jury and co-authors uh, had measuring inflation, expectation in, inflation expectations in Italy, we're basically doing something similar, measuring in U.S. inflation using Twitter. So again, the intuition here is that tweets reflect information on current or future prices, or at least, again, as perceptions, right? So people tweet about uh, prices that are crazy high or, you know, gas lines or things like that. And so what we're trying to do is build Twitter-based inflation indices for the U.S. along the lines of um, my uh, co-author and, and his previous co-authors. Um, so data from Twitter that we use, there's around 30 and a half million tweets that are written by users in the U.S. Um, we're going to use both from our time period, which is beginning of January 2018 until April uh, 2022. Um, we're going to use both tweets and retweets um, and that represents around 25 million individual accounts. Um, the features that uh, we have available are the full text and the metadata. So, so the metadata includes the user's bio, uh, retweets, the number of followers, some, some rough geolocation information. Um, and the key thing is to, to narrow down the set of tweets to the ones uh, that are most relevant. We require the tweets to contain one or more of the keywords on inflation or deflation. So we have a rough initial dictionary uh, to seed that latent Dirichlet um, uh, algorithm. Okay, so in terms of tweet selection, these are some of the keywords that we use to select those tweets in English that are talking about prices or inflation or deflation. Um, recognize there's a little bit of subjectivity in identifying these terms, but this is what we use to start with. Um, sorry, and then basically this is just the distribution of the user-identified biography. So this is how users identify themselves as their main area of focus or, or interest. Um, this just gives a little bit of the top 15 words characterizing each, uh, each of these user topics. And so one of the things that you see is that they're quite distinct. Okay, so in terms of the steps that we go through, there's a number, and so this is pretty common to most textual analysis. There's some pre-processing steps that one needs to do. So the first thing is we're going to lowercase all the tweets and remove all these special characters, um, mentions, emojis, things like that, URLs. Um, and we're going to replace the, ex the contractions with the extended form. So basically, any doesn't refer, you know, translates into does not, isn't, is not, etc. We're going to remove single character words. Um, and then one of the things that's important in textual processing is building these n-grams. So these are common sequences of words, two, three, or four in this case, uh, that show up fairly frequently. Um, like um, like um, prices up or prices down. Um, and we're going to manually label the most frequent n-grams. Those are, are n-grams that are contained in at least 0.025% of all the original tweets each year. Okay, so this is just a, I know it's hard to read the, the, um, the slide, but this is just a, a characterization of the 10 most frequent bigrams, uh, both in the, in the inflation bit. So those are things like prices rising, price increase, higher gas, uh, sky high, um, and then the, um, the top 10 most frequent deflationary bigrams, prices lower, lower gas, price drop, uh, et cetera. So this is just, so based on that, we build an index um, for the U.S., and, and we've separated this out into both the, the overall component, which is that blue line. Um, the blue line here, we have a deflationary uh, bit, which is the, the bottom line here. Uh, and, and an inflationary bit, which is the top line here, and then we've plotted that versus overall uh, CPI. So you can see that it, it, it certainly seems to track. Um, it's obviously not exact, um, and so that's basically where we're going next, is, is working on uh, um, the building the index in a, in a way that, uh, that characterizes inflation, but it seems to do pretty well. Um, one of the things that's interesting is that we can separate out this inflation index by these different uh, types of users. Uh, so, for instance, you can see that, um, so this uh, here is the, is the um, political, um, the influencer um, and, and family uh, tend to be um, sort of at the higher end of being concerned about inflation relative to some of the other, um, some of the other categories. So that's a brief introduction to uh, what we're doing on the, on the Twitter side and on the inflation side. The rest of the remainder of the talk, I want to focus 
uh, on this new paper with Jin Zhang, Christoph Bursch, and Isaiah Hall, all from the Swedish, uh, the Sveriges Riksbank. Um, and, and one of the reasons I want to focus on this is that this paper diverges from the other papers in that it doesn't use latent Richelieu allocation. And in fact, we use state-of-the-art methods uh, now to, to um, approach, approach the textual analysis. Okay, so the motivation behind this paper is that the global financial crisis showed us that financial stability matters. Okay, but there's been a continuing debate since the financial crisis as to whose responsibility is it uh, for dealing with financial stability. Is it the regulator? Is it the Fed? Uh, or the central bank? Uh, is it somebody else? Um, and in particular, there's been a large discussion over whether financial stability is or should be part of the central bank's mandate uh, and the extent to which they should employ their policy tools to affect it, uh, to affect financial stability. In general, central banks have been reluctant to explicitly embrace financial stability as part of their mandate, uh, so they haven't incorporated in, it, it in uh, to, to the explicit um, mandate, which typically is related to price stability and sometimes maximum sustainable employment. Um, but yet we all uh, have seen lots of speeches uh, and references to the importance of financial stability uh, to the global system and, um, and something that central banks worry about. So there's, an, there's a very important recent paper that isn't related to textual analysis, but I wanted to mention, uh, we just became aware of it a, a, a few months ago, um, by Bianchi, Letow, and Ludvigsen. And one of the things that this paper, in the JF, one of the things that this paper highlights uh, is they focus, or they, they talk about this puzzle that, that uh, has been around for a long time, uh, related to the asset price response to monetary policy decisions. Um, and one of the things that's puzzling to uh, financial, um, to, to financial, um, academics is that some aspect of these monetary policy decisions appears to have a long-lasting effect. And that sort of goes against our, you know, what we think of as efficient markets and things like that, where we would expect that information would be incorporated um, quite quickly. Um, so, so what Bianchi, Letta, and Ludvigsen find is that they find that there are regime shifts that are related to investor beliefs. And in, particularly, in particular, they note that there are sticky expectations related to inflation. So, so that's one of the things that they, or one of the um, reasons that they offer as to why there's these long-lasting effects, uh, because expectations are slow to, um, to evolve or change. Um, and then they also uh, link some of this long-lasting uh, effect to the conduct of monetary policy. Um, and so one of the things that they say in their paper is that once, um, once the economy or the financial markets enter into a regime, the memory of the past sort of fades, and the existing regime is sort of the new normal. Okay, think about the you know more than decade-long uh, zero lower bound uh, period that we were recently in, until of course all of a sudden tightening happened, um, and you know or the COVID pandemic for that reason. We we forget what it was like to to have real conferences and and you know to not be wearing masks and things like that. Um, so so we can consider so so what's interesting about this paper, um, and it, I think it really helps to motivate um, our work is that. Uh, in their paper, they link this to heterogeneity and differences in investor beliefs, right? So this, this memory of the past fading and the existing regime becoming the new normal is attributed to investors. And we can consider these theories similarly in the context of policymakers, right? So is it actually the investors or the, or the financial market agents uh, that are driving these long-lasting effects through um, perceptions and, and you know, uh, past memory or memory of the past fading? Or is it actually the central bankers themselves? To what extent do uh, members or do policymakers similarly forget the past, adjust to a new normal, things like that? So what we're doing in our paper is we want to know to what extent does the Fed believe uh, in the effectiveness of monetary policy and or banking regulation tools to achieve financial stability? And in particular, what we're interested in is what drives that thought process. So to what extent do they rely on similarity to, to peers on the FOMC versus institutional memory or history, so of the specific reserve banks? Um, how much of, of the thought process is related to knowledge of the past versus the present versus thinking about the future? And to what extent do they rely on academic literature to drive some of the um, debate? We assemble what we think is the most comprehensive collection of speeches to date, building on that initial corpus that I uh, had with Mirta. Um, we've augmented that quite substantially. Uh, we use state-of-the-art natural language processing tools to extract the most significant concerns from uh, these speeches. And then we're going to identify the semantic textual similarities across the speeches. 
We also identify states of the economy and discussion topics that are closely associated with these financial stability concerns. Uh, and what we find in the, at the end of the paper, we use the constructed semantic variables uh, to think about asset classes, and we find that these semantic variables predict a broad range of asset class uh, returns. So in asking this question of whether it's the agents or the bankers themselves, we, do, we conduct tailor rule regressions to assess whether non-dual mandate, whether there are non-dual mandate related concerns, and in specific, particularly financial stability. Uh, we find that, that more dual, non-dual mandate related talk is negatively associated with a shadow Fed funds rate, uh, and in particular, more dovish policy decisions. The financial stability text feature that we identify is associated with these more dovish policy decisions, while the monetary financial text feature is associated with more hawkish policy decisions. So that's just the upfront, here's what we find. I'm going to explain to you how we find that in a second. Okay, so the data that we have, as I said, we've assembled this very comprehensive uh, data set corpus of Federal Reserve speeches. It spans all the way from 1914, right after the Fed began, to 2020, but, but it's quite spotty in those early years. The most comprehensive part of the corpus is from 1960 to 2020, and that's what we're going to focus on for our analysis. It consists of all the voting and non-voting FOMC members, so the seven, uh, or the chair plus six members of the Board of Governors, plus the 12 uh, Federal Reserve Bank presidents. We're going to combine that with a, with a second cor corpus, which consists of journal articles and working papers related to central banks. For that, we use the Semantic Scholar Open Corpus that was generated by Andy Lowe and his uh, co-authors. Um, and, and we're going to extract from that articles from the economics uh, group or theme that are related to macro, monetary, and financial markets. Requirement for our analysis is it has to have an abstract available because the abstracts are what we're going to use for the corpus. Um, and we also require that the publication outlet of these uh, papers has at least 500 entries in the overall database. Okay, that gets us down to 328,370 articles, 29,000 of which have a specific reference to central banks. We're also going to use macro and financial variables coming from the Jordan et al. macro history database. Uh, our output gap data is going to come from FRED because that's measured annually. So what we use for our methods are what we call transformer models. And transformer models map one sequence of symbols to another. So they employ the sequence to se sequence modeling. Uh, and what, what these models do is they take a set of input symbols, call those words, uh, and they map those to output symbols that can then be used for natural language processing ta tasks. So as I said, that's thinking about how we take vector of words, map that to vector of another words. Um, it's useful for sentiment analysis, uh, for things like zero shot classification, um, which is basically classification, the ability to classify without training uh, the corpus, textual similarity measurement, machine translation, contextual embedding, uh, and extractive text summarization. And again, some of these I'll define a bit later because we employ them in what we do. Um, we can use these sequence-to-sequence -sequence models uh, to measure various text features on the Fed speeches, and we're going to focus on elements related to financial stability and the dual mandate. So one of the things we're going to try to capture is, for instance, what is the speaker's primary concern in their speech? What is the extent to which their statement expresses approval for use of monetary policy or banking regulation to achieve financial stability? Um, and we're going to be able to classify whether a certain type of content is present in the speech or not. Now, despite the fact that these transformer models are state of the art, they're not without some challenges. So, and in particular, challenges when you use them. And we heard about transformer models in some of the earlier uh, talks uh, at the conference. Uh, one of the challenges in using transformer models in thinking about text um, is that it requires variation in the input and output length, right? So, so we can't really use a, a, a neural network kind of approach. Um, we, have to, we have to do something that allows us to take, say, a set of words, and then uh, that translates into a set of other words that are bigger or smaller. Um, so early versions of um, these uh, sequence to sequence models um, use something called the long short term memory model um, that treats the input as a sequence rather than a set of individual uh, words. And that these long uh, short term memory models can handle that varying length. What it does or what it did was it used an encoder decoder architecture. And, and so what happens is there's an encoder that takes the sequence of symbols, again, these words, maps them to a latent vector, which is some kind of compressed representation of the input text. 
uh, and, then, and then there's a decoder that's applied to this latent vector um, to then output the sequence of symbol predictions, so the predicted words. Now, the challenge with this encoder decoder architecture sorry, is, that, um, is that basically this latent vector created a bottleneck, right? So all of these, you know, this giant vector and the bigger the vector was, it still had to get through the latent vector to then come out with the output. And that meant that it was computationally intensive. So the attention mechanism um, approach sort of eliminates this need uh, by determining which symbols are related without explicitly considering this ordering, the temporal ordering. Um, so for a given symbol, basically, um, for instance, a word, the attention mechanism determines which symbols are related to it without explicitly considering the order in which they appear. So it looks more comprehensively at, you know, say, a, a sentence or a paragraph, and it identifies words that are going to show up in proximity without worrying about whether it's right next to a word in question. Um, so, so the transformer model removes these sequential components. It also takes advantage of pre-training. Um, and, and the benefit of that, so, that's, so, so the pre-training in, um, in this approach uh, means that you can train the model on a very large auxiliary data set that's unrelated to the natural language processing task of interest. So this is where our corpus of these articles related to, um, to monetary policy and central banks comes in, totally different corpus than the one that we're gonna focus on for our analysis, namely the Federal Reserve speeches, but we can draw inference and use all of the, uh, all of the information that's embedded in uh, the language that's described in that corpus and bring that to bear in, our, in, in the task that we have in hand, which is analyzing the Federal Reserve speeches. Um, so this pre-training, so, so that allows us to fine tune the model um, on a small amount or on, on this sort of corpus of closely related text. Um, and, and that pre-training has led to substantial gains in the development of these language models. Um, it also allows for bi-directionality of interpretation of sequences. So rather than, again, predicting the next word, what we're training, is, if, what we're training the, the algorithm to do is to predict just some missing word. Um, conditional on all the words that show up before and after that word. So related to this, there are two very important models that we use. Uh, the first was the BERT model that was um, first proposed by Devlin et al., uh, and then a follow-up model, the Roberta model, uh, by Liu et al. Um, I'll talk about them in sequence. So basically, the BERT model concentrates on two tasks. So one is what's called mass language modeling, and the second is next sequence prediction. And both of these automatically generate these labels. And again, the labels are going to be important for identifying um, the, the characteristics of the text that we care about. So mass language modeling involves masking randomly selected words in a sequence and training the model to predict them. So think about having, for instance, a paragraph where you randomly um, uh, take out certain words. And then you basically ask the algorithm to predict what the missing word is. right? Um, so, I mean, in some ways we can think about this even with, um, you know, we, we, we have techniques like that related to, for instance, you know, missing observations in survey data, right? It's somewhat, it's, it's, it's somewhat similar, except now we're applying it to text. Um, next sequence prediction actually takes pairs of sentences and asks the model to determine whether they're sequential or not, right? So you take all the, you know, the combinations of all the pairs of sentences uh, in your corpus and you can train the model by you know, basically a simple binary, is this a, a sequential pair of sentences or not? Uh, and that can help then uh, the model to predict in the future uh, whether sentences come together or not. So, so in contrast to these dictionary-based approaches like the LDA, BERT takes these left-right dependencies into account. So again, whether a sentence is before or after, can handle negations and it handles these sort of subtle modifiers. Now, the, the Roberta method by Liu et al. argue that the gains that, that are achieved from BERT uh, are actually mainly due to the pre-training. Um, and so they employ, so Roberta allows you to employ much larger data sets and it removes this next sequence prediction task. So it's training on larger and larger sequence lengths. So one of the first things we have to, to, to do in, in employing these algorithms is we have to think about how text is generated. Okay, so and for that we employ zero shot, shot learning. So supervised classification, right, like LDA, requires an appropriate data set or labels. Um, and so what happens is we're going to start by constructing our corpus of text sequences and labels that are outside the domain of interest using that semantic scholar uh, database. We're going to then concatenate pairs of sequences um, or pairs of sentences, um, and then we're going to train the supervised model to predict if they match or not. Okay, as an example of how this works, here's a little uh, short bit from a speech by Gary Stern. 
uh, in 2009. So the sequence that we're going to try to analyze, banks continue to play this role, but it's become more challenging today to do so because some lenders find themselves capital constrained as a result of recent losses and or sizable unanticipated additions to their balance sheets of formerly off-balance sheet instruments. So we feed the, um, so, so you, you feed the, um, the algorithm some candidate classes, the classes that we're interested in, financial stability, output, inflation, labor market, roughly thinking about um, the, some of the aspects of the, of, of the Taylor rule or the Fed's mandate, uh, plus financial stability. And so the algorithm then scores the text, the sequence, with respect to these candidate classes, comes up with the following probabilities. These probabilities sum to one, but so 71.8% uh, is attributable to financial stability, and you can see that a very small percentage is, is attributable to labor market. So we're going to do that for all these sequences that we have in the corpus. Okay, so the other thing that we employ, um, or is a key feature of, of BERT, is the extractive question answering. And, and extractive question answering is used to extract the speaker's most pressing concern in a passage. Okay, so BERT was initially trained to perform on the Stanford question answering data set, um, which consisted of 100,000 human labeled questions answered and context packages. And one of the things that they found from BERT is that it exceeded human level performance. So in other words, if you ask humans to identify what these texts um, were about, um, it turned out that BERT actually did a better job of classifying than, than the humans did. Um, so just to give some examples of how this works, here's two passages from a February 1972 speech by then president uh, of the St. Louis uh, Fed, Daryl Francis. So, so one of the key things is, that, or one of the, the tricky elements of um, these approaches is coming up with, a, with, with, is the specification of the query. So in this case, our query is, what's the most significant concern in this package, or sorry, in this passage? Um, so the first context, suspension of the convertibility of the dollar into gold and the imposition of a 10% import surcharge last summer ran the risk of mass foreign retaliation in the form of destructive trade barriers. Okay, we run that through our algorithm, and the output that it provides is that the most significant concern is mass foreign retaliation, right? And you can see from this passage that it mentions a lot of other things, but the algorithm does seem to do a good job of honing in on what, you know, the, the, the passage was about. Um, so um, we have another passage from the same speech. Another significant aspect of the president's new policies announced August 15th are the measures taken to reverse the deteriorating U.S. balance of payments. And again, the output from that is deteriorate, deteriorating U.S. balance of payments. So once we extract these, um, these and, and label or classify the text, we want to use semantic textual similarity. Um, and what that does is allows us to evaluate whether two sentences are closely related. Now, again, typically this is computationally intensive because it requires you to feed pairs of pass passages uh, into the algorithm. So if you have 10,000 sentences, for instance, that would require 50 million pairs of passages. Um, so an alternative is to construct these sequence embeddings. Um, and, and what that does is it computes first the semantic features for the, for the passage. So we're going to use uh, some of the extractive questioning, identify the semantic features, and then look at similarities using cosine similarity between the, the different embeddings, right? So that gets rid of the, all, the, all the textual part. We're gonna, um, we're, we're gonna characterize the text in terms of these embeddings, and then we can just uh, do our uh, analysis using the cosine similarity between these basically vectors. So we're gonna use transformer-based sequential denoising autoencoders, um, and what that does is it injects noise into these embeddings, and then it trains the model to recover the denoised embeddings, right? So, so basically that's you know, exactly as it sounds, Add some noise into the into the into the um, into the vector right of the, the semantic features, and then basically train the model as to how to get rid of some of that noise to, to recover the, the core elements of the vector. Okay, so we're going to use zero shot classification um, at the um, at the paragraph level using BERT, um, and from that we're going to extract out the probabilities that the paragraph discusses specific phrases. So in this case, the paragraphs or the phrases that we care about are financial stability, financial crisis, bank liquidity, and bank capital. There's a few other ones as well that, uh, that we're going to extract. And the objective is to consider how discussion relates to the Fed's interpretation of its mandate. Um, and so as a result, we're also going to create indices for inflation, employment, and output growth. Okay, and you can see here from the financial stability index, this is just a three... Um, or, sorry, this is a 24-month rolling mean of the financial stability index that comes from uh, our approach with the extractive, uh, extracting content. 
Um, and one of the things that you can see is, for instance, the highest levels uh, coincide up here with the Great Recession. Um, there's declines in the late 60s and 70s. Um, and there's a spike here around the Latin debt crisis um, in 1982. And then the financial stability concerns decline again uh, until a spike around 1998 um, related to the Asian Russian crisis and the collapse of long term capital management. Now, with these indices, we can also then compute average scores for financial stability by speaker and by institution. I should have mentioned we have 94. Uh, different speakers in our in our corpus of, of Federal Reserve speeches. Um, and so these are just scores uh, related to financial stability, related to how much uh, financial stability there, content there is relative to the average uh, in, in when you classify or, or break it down into these two groups. So you can see, for instance, on the left, we've got uh, the breakdown by uh, Federal Reserve District. We've got the, the Board of Governors in here as well. Um, and one of the things that you see is that New York and Rhode Island have the highest average scores. Um, the other thing on the right is that we have scores associated with different speakers. Uh, we've just listed sort of the, the highest uh, financial stability scores. And one of the things that immediately uh, shows up is that speakers with uh, the speakers with the highest scores, uh, for the most part, um, were officials that were um, Federal Reserve officials during the period surrounding the global financial crisis. Um, in general, Reserve Bank president speeches have less financial stability content uh, than members of the board. Um, and the most negative scores, uh, that's not shown here, but we've got the full results in the paper, but the most negative scores uh, associated with the Reserve Bank presidents were those who were serving near the start of the Great Moderation. So this is just basically some descriptive statistics that, that sort of indicate that, that the algorithm's working reasonably well in, in identifying um, um, focus on financial stability that's consistent with what our intuition might suggest. We also construct a financial crisis index um, and, and there we see a general upward trend prior to the uh, start of the Great Moderation uh, in the mid-80s, and then a lull between 2000 and 2007. Um, and one of the things that's interesting here in the Financial Crisis Index, as opposed to the Financial Stability Index, is that that spike around the Asia-Russia crisis in 1998 is, and, and the collapse of LTCM are not apparent in thinking about financial crisis versus financial stability. Uh, in this graph, we, we show the inflation output growth and financial stability indices combined. One of the things that you notice is that inflation features most prominently uh, in the late 70s and early 80s, not surprisingly, um, and also that financial stability and output diverge prior to the Great Moderation, okay, but then they positively co-move thereafter. Okay, so the next thing we, we do is we look at the cosine similarity between banking regulation. So we have a banking regulation index and our financial stability index. And this, just, this uh, graph plots the cosine similarity between those two features or those two vectors. Um, and one of the things that you notice is that the peaks are closely related to the crisis events. The other thing that's interesting is that this cosine similarity is quite jagged. Um, and that jagged nature suggests um, that, that Federal Reserve officials through their speeches um, seem to, to um, seem to highlight or, or, or seem to reflect uh, an episodic role for using banking reg regulation rather than a sustained tool. So banking regulation is something that should be or that that um, that through their speeches they think should be employed to achieve financial stability at very episodic points, but not uh, not sustained uh, throughout uh, their what they do in their policy making. Um, here's another one, which is looking at the cosine similarity between monetary policy and financial stability. So this is a response. This is basically um, responding to the question of, well, no, so, sorry, this is just extracting out monetary policy index and financial stability. One of the things that you notice is that there's a clear difference versus the banking regulation graph. Um, and in particular, recently, there's much less appetite for the use of monetary policy in conjunction with achieving financial stability. Um, the support for this relationship seems to vary according to the level of accommodation in the Fed stance, and in particular, support for the use of monetary policy to achieve financial stability seems to increase during tightening cycles as opposed to during easing cycles. This is just a, a graph of the indices related to past, present, and future focus. Actually, I'll skip through that and focus on this. This is the difference between that future index and the past index. And so one of the things that you can see here is that there's an increased use of the future tense. There has been an increased use of the future tense since the start of the Great Moderation. And this coincides with the Fed's emphasis on increased transparency and the provision of forward guidance. 
Prior to the Great Moderation, the use of the future tense uh, seemed to coincide more with tightening episodes, and the shift to the past coincided with easing. Okay, we also can, can do a breakdown looking at the average tense scores by uh, Federal Reserve District. And one of the things that we notice is that um, New York and, and uh, Richmond seem to have the highest uh, future scores. Um, and this isn't surprising, basically. So, so the highest future scores, um, this isn't surprising given the strong connection between uh, the future and financial stability that we saw um, in the cosine similarity results, and in particular, New York and Richmond uh, are the districts that, have the, that, that are responsible for the supervision of the largest financial institutions in the US. Um, New York also has the, the highest past and present score, and so you might wonder, well, you know, how can that be? You have the highest past, present, and future score. Basically, what that indicates is that tense usage uh, is clearer and more distinct in the speeches of its Reserve Bank presidents than in other uh, Reserve Bank presidents. Um, the discussions of financial stability uh, tend to involve more forward-looking language, in particular, the correlation uh, between the financial stability index and this future uh, index is, is, point, is around 0.65. Now, we also asked the question of, of the extent to which academic discussions influence financial or influence uh, central bank deliberations. Um, Greg Mankiw in 2006 argued that policymaking was largely uninformed by academic literature, um, in part because the, 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 the point was that um, the policymaking is happening in real time before the academics have had a chance to analyze um, um, what was the events that were unfolding. Um, but there are other uh, views that, that and, and how it um, also mentions that central banks are facing crises that haven't previously been studied and therefore they lead the literature. Um, but there are others that have argued that macroprudential and not monetary policy should be achieve, used to achieve financial stability and that actually motivates our question of, of whether banking regulation or monetary policy should be uh, used to achieve monetary, um, uh, to achieve financial stability. Um, New York and Rhode Island again have the highest, or sorry, New York and Richmond, sorry, um, have the highest academic focus, um, and, and that's again consistent with the fact that Richmond's presidents uh, for, uh, throughout its history were uh, academics. Uh, the board, uh, which also has quite a lot of academics, um, also has a fairly high academic score. So, we use, so what we do next is we use this extractive questioning um, or question answering to identify the question of what is the most significant concern in a passage. We do that looking at all the, the, the passages, all the paragraphs uh, in our corpus. So this figure visualizes this most, these most significant concerns uh, related to financial stability and how they evolve over time. Okay, so we identify these paragraphs about financial stability using zero-shot learning, and then we're going to extract these questions uh, or these concerns using our extractive question answering, just visualizing them as a word cloud. So one of the things that we see in the top, we've got the first uh, third of the sample roughly, so from 1960 to 1983, uh, the most significant concerns pretty much align with the dual mandate. The words are more, so you know, price we've got, stability, inflation, monetary, growth, uh, economic. One of the key things is that the words during this period from the speeches are much more economic. Uh, they're, they're very economic and less financial. In the middle bit from 1984 to 2006, Stability becomes very dominant, and financial also becomes apparent. So we start to see financial creeping in, but price is obviously still important during that time. In the bottom part, so in the run-up right before the uh, prior to the global financial crisis, uh, up to around now, um, finance and stability have near equal prominence, um, and there's a much greater focus on price stability on the price stability side of the dual mandate. You can see, for instance, that monetary um, has has become much smaller than than in that first third. So what we have here is a clustering of the financial stability content across all speeches. Um, these dots, the colors of the dots, represent the different reserve banks um, down here. Um, and so the speeches, as I mentioned, are represented as these sequence embeddings. Um, and so for each paragraph of a speech, we get a 768 dimensional vector um, that describes these different text features. Okay, and so, so we compute the average vector for each district and month. So we take all the speeches in a particular month in a particular district. We compute the average feature, uh, and then we're going to characterize this in this visualization. Um, so, um, and, and so this is just the technical side of things. It's using a t-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding uh, to be able to represent these 760 dimensions in a two-dimensional figure. Um, one of the things that, that really jumps out here is that New York um, has pretty much a self-contained cluster. 
Um, so what that means is that the, the content in the speeches of the New York Reserve Bank are closer to its own past financial stability discussions than contemporaneous con uh, communication with peers on the FOMC. In contrast, we've got St. Louis, which is the, this, this pink, uh, the pink dots uh, throughout this. Uh, St. Louis is a, is a long cluster that overlaps with the communication of many uh, other districts. So these visualizations, and again, this is just a, a preliminary one, um, but they, they potentially uh, provide a lot of ability to, to see how communication is, is you know, linked uh, going back to that Bianchi, Ludwig, uh, Ludwigson, and, and Letow paper, uh, thinking about how much um, um, members of the, of the FOMC rely on uh, communication or communication patterns from their own institution versus drawing on communication patterns or reflecting communication patterns uh, of their peers. So the final thing we do is we do an, a regression analysis um, the objective of the regression analysis is to identify states of the economy and to determine how discussion of these topics are associated with financial stability concern that varies over these states. So we're going to determine the underlying drivers and content of these financial stability discussions uh, at the Fed. And our, our primary specification is just a linear specification uh, that includes um, these tau's. So the tau's are the variables or sets of variables that correspond to a text feature. They're computed at the paragraph uh, j and time t level. Um, we've got these text features related to financial stability, financial crisis, inflation, uh, employment, um, um, bank capital, bank liquidity, um, um, and, uh, and various macro variables uh, as well, and financial variables. So macro variables, inflation output gap, uh, house prices, debt to GDP, and then the financial variables, short-term interest rate, uh, financial crisis indicator, loan to deposit ratio, et cetera. Um, so those are controls and those are uh, characterized uh, by these news. Okay, the dependent variable is the measure of financial st stability content of a particular paragraph. So this, this Y is the, the measure of financial stability content. Uh, so sometimes we'll use the financial stability index itself. Sometimes we'll use that cosine similarity that I showed you in the pictures. Okay, and in the paper we have a whole set of these. We do this for contemporaneous lag -like variables cluster standard errors and, and things like that. Um, we, we have a full sample analysis and then we do the two sample splits, 1960 to 83, uh, so the period before the Great Moderation and then after. Okay, so this is our, this is um, the set of estimates um, and, and basically I'm gonna walk us through uh, each set of these uh, sort of one by one. Okay, so the first question is, is financial stability discussed? So remember the dependent variable is some indicator of financial stability, either the index itself or the cosine similarity. And so the first question we wanna think about is, is financial stability typically discussed in the context of the dual mandate or separately? And we find strong evidence that it's discussed in conjunction with the dual mandate, more so for uh, employment than inflation. That's just based on the fact that the coefficient is three times the size, three times the magnitude uh, of the inflation um, magnitude. Now, one of the things that's interesting is that even though we find strong evidence in the sample overall, uh, this is not the case for the subsamples. And in particular, there's a negative coefficient, um, negative and statistically significant coefficient between inflation and financial stability uh, prior to the Great Moderation. During the Great Moderation, the relationship with inflation becomes strongly positive. Uh, employment is still positive, suggesting that, that during that time there was a trade-off between stabilizing prices and stabilizing the financial, sorry, suggesting that the trade-off between stabilizing prices and stabilizing the financial sector that existed in the, in the prior period no longer exists. Um, we then look at the financial crisis uh, index and what we find is one standard, de so, so the way to interpret these coefficients is that a one standard deviation increase in the discussion of financial crises in speeches is associated with a 0 0.09 standard deviation increase in financial stability discussion, uh, irrespective of the state of the economy. We find that, uh, we find that coefficient um, again got stronger in the later period. Now, if we look at academic focus, um, what we find is that the focus on academic debates is associated with increased financial stability discussion. Uh, so the more that a speech seems to reflect ac an academic focus, uh, often academic uh, evidence is being drawn on to discuss in the context of, of discussing financial stability. Uh, 
We also find, again, reflecting the descriptive uh, graph that I showed you earlier, that statements about financial stability tend to be framed in the present and the future. And that tendency to frame discussion about financial stability in the present and the future increased during the Great Moderation. Okay, so just to summarize our key findings, we find strong evidence that financial stability is typically discussed in conjunction with the dual mandate. Prior to the moderation, the financial stability content had a negative relationship with inflation. Um, and again, statements about financial stability tend to be framed in the present and the future. So in the last bit of this talk, and I do want to uh, leave some time for questions, um, one of the things that we look at now is the, is, is the question of to what extent should either monetary policy or banking regulation be used to achieve financial stability? Okay, so the, this first question, um, so, so, so again, remember the graphs that I showed you about the academic focus. Academic focus tends to oppose using either one to achieve uh, financial stability. Um, and what we found is that opposition to the use of monetary policy has declined uh, during the great moderation. Um, and, and opposition to the use of banking regulation has actually increased. Okay, and so you can see that um, from here. Okay, now statements about financial stability tend to be framed in the present or the future, um, and advocacy for the, and in some ways this is, this is consistent with our intuition, that advocacy for the use of monetary policy tends to hinge on past examples and future hypotheticals, right? Um, whereas advocacy for use of banking regulation tends to be focused on the present, um, and again, that you know is somewhat intuitive in that um, typically, if there's a if there's a present financial stability pressing concern, uh, that's where policymakers would tend to employ uh, the the kinds of banking um, regulatory um, tools that that they employed during the financial crisis. Okay, and then the final thing that we uh, do is we we sort of regress these broad categories of asset returns, so equity bonds, uh, risky and safe assets. Um, on our text factors, financial ratios, and returns. We control for the, the macro and financial uh, controls, um, and what we find is that the financial stability score, oops, sorry, um, the financial stability score um, has, is negatively associated with equities and risky assets, um, which, which again makes, makes sense that when there's concerns about financial stability, that does tend to be associated with uh, negative um, returns in the financial markets. Um, bank capital discussion, however, has the opposite effect. So when uh, there's discussions of bank capital, that tends to be associated with uh, discussions of, so, so high bank capital, uh, high financial stability. Um, financial crisis has a negative association for all assets. So basically, discussion of financial crisis um, is, is bad news for all assets, um, or financial crisis in conjunction with financial stability. Um, bank liquidity has a negative association for all assets except for safe assets where it's not significant. The past or present or use of past or present language is associated with positive returns for bonds and safe assets, um, whereas the future focus is associated with positive returns for equities and risky assets. Okay, so again, that forward-looking guidance uh, suggesting things are under control and, and stable. Um, Okay, so the key findings on the asset returns, um, again, mainly the financial stability discussion was negatively associated with equity and risky assets. Bank capital discussion had the opposite effect. Um, financial crisis had a negative effect for all assets, and bank liquidity had a negative effect for all but the safe assets. Um, I think we'll just, given the, the time, why don't I stop there? So, so that's basically, that runs you through our paper. We're continuing. Uh, to, to, to work in this area. And, and again, one of the things that's so powerful about uh, the, the technique is that we can ask queries uh, that then answer questions about uh, the role in which uh, central banks or central bank speeches are thinking about certain topics in the context of financial stability. So that's, um, that's, that's where this is heading. Uh, thank you for your time, and I look forward to questions. Thank you, Robin. And there's plenty of time for questions. So, uh, Renee? Yes, that's quite an impressive uh, work. And uh, I have one question. I mean, like, uh, you did not really use news coverage, okay? And, uh, you know, newspapers. And so I was wondering to what extent uh, looking at this 
amount of data, you know, from the speeches, from uh, the academic literature, uh, will be summarized in a way in the news coverage. I mean, you know, because then, I mean, like you'll search for less time, but maybe you'll get the same message or not, or, you know. Yeah, it's a very good question. I mean, one of the things, so there, there is a large literature that looks at news coverage and, and some, you know, that we saw during the conference as well. Um, and I think in some ways it's a, it's a very important complement uh, to what we do. So, you know, as I mentioned, one of the things that's interesting and, you know, I, and in some ways I didn't mention this at, at the beginning, but, but if we think about the role of communication, um, you, know, if we, you know, everything from the emails that we send to, you know, uh, in-person communications or, uh, or written communications, communication hinges on two things. The, the, um, the, the goal of the sender and the interpretation of the receiver. And so in some ways, if we think about, there, there is a large literature that has looked at news and, and in conjunction with things like Federal Reserve speeches uh, to highlight that in fact, uh, the news does not always focus, you know, if, if you look at the, the, the key topics in the speeches and then the key topics is covered by news, uh, often those, those two things are, they're, they're certainly not completely correlated and often they're somewhat orthogonal. Um, so I think it's a very important uh, aspect of this, of, of the natural language uh, research as well, the communication literature. Um, and perception literature, we haven't uh, employed it uh, in this, but but in other uh, contexts, I've I've looked at it. I do have a paper that I, I didn't mention, but that that is looking at the uh, role of the um, UK's communications during the COVID crisis uh, and how that relates to, for instance, um, tweets uh, about uh, the interpretation of the policies. That's also not exactly news, but we combine that with news indices from a variety of news outlets uh, to to compare those. But I think it's a very important avenue as well. Thank you. Yeah, I, I had a, two questions actually. The first one was kind of whether you had thought about like league and lack relation, relationships in, in terms of like uh, macroeconomic outcomes. Cause like we do see that for example, changes in the topics for example, that are covered in the news do lead basically outcomes. And it'd be really interesting to see in particular for the Fed, whether their communication actually is affecting markets or whether they're just basically track trailing basically the conversation that's happening. And in the same sense, also going back to Renee's point, um, it'd be also interesting to see whether the Fed is just basically picking up conversations that are happening basically in traditional media and, and maybe social chatter, or whether they are actually leading the conversation that's happening outside, right? Because it'd be interesting to see where the information comes from in a way, who's, who's the originator in a way. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, we have looked at lead lag in the context of the, um, of the features, of the text features. We haven't done it in the context of the asset returns uh, yet, but obviously that's something um, easy to do. But, um, but yeah, so I think, I think that's important and, and relatively easy. In terms of picking up uh, whether, the, whether the Fed is reflecting the news or the news is reflecting the Fed, that's also something that I think is very interesting. And the, the um, easy example that comes to mind is in, the, um, in early 2004 when, uh, you know, at the, before the financial crisis when the, the Fed had been at its historically lowest rates ever um, and there were starting to be signs of inflation heating up, there was a lot of discussion about the Fed being behind the curve. Um, and that, you can see, if you go back historically through the, the minutes and the transcripts, that they definitely were talking about uh, the fact that the markets seemed to be concerned that they were behind the curve and waiting uh, to, to, to tighten. Um, so I think there is some, some that's just anecdotal evidence, um, but there, there certainly seems to be anecdotal evidence that, that they're aware uh, of it. How much do they use that in their policy uh, decisions? Uh, and again, I'm just going to disclaim, I'm not speaking on behalf of the Fed, but, um, but, but basically I, I think, you know, one of the things um, that, that not just the Fed, but central banks in general have tried to do is, is they don't want to be uh, perceived as being reactive. They definitely want to be proactive. Uh, and so, and, and they also are a bit more long-term focused. So, so at least uh, one would hope that they're not responding just to the latest news. But I think, again, it's a very interesting empirical question uh, to look at that. And, you know, to what extent are they uh, focused on very short-term information versus long-term? Again, the, 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 the tricky but also fun aspect of this is coming up with a query that would ask that question to allow for the extractive um, analysis. Thank you. So, so I think I have the sort of flip side question of Gustavo's version in some sense, right? So there's a literature on like the Greenspan put uh, and, and sort of, so, so the question is sort of in some sense, in what, in what sense past asset returns are driving Fed policy um, and, and sort of to what extent you've looked into that. 
Yeah, we haven't looked at that. I mean, again, there's a large literature that, that has, but, um, but that is where, I mean, one of the things that's, that I'm very excited about with respect to natural language processing is that a lot of these somewhat more classical questions uh, that, that we've had in the literature for, for many years, we now have the capability of using textual analysis to, to bring new insights to bear uh, on that, and that's why I think this is such an important um, field or area of, of research. So I think that's a great question. We haven't looked at it, but it's, it's certainly something that one could use uh, this machinery to look at. Um, <clears throat> so I, similar to some of the other questions, it seems like you have the technology to make a forecast of the next Fed statement given a bunch of measures of the economic environment. Like, and I guess with another layer of technology, you could pre-write the next Fed statement, <laughs> and then compare it with the actual statement. Now, maybe you could skip that step and just do your numerical summary, but it seems like you've got all the ingredients to, to have a quantitative measure for how surprising that a, a just release statement is, given all of the stuff that's been in financial markets, all the stuff that's been in the news. Like, you could, you could have a, a real quantitative measure for the surprise element of a statement, or is it just completely predictable given everything that was observed before the Fed well, release. so this is the key thing, and so 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 I don't want to don't want to overclaim what we can do. So first of all, remember that we're looking at speeches, not statements. So if we think about the statement, the policy statement itself, as I mentioned, is is very short, and tends to change as little as possible. And and I think actually that's an intent of policymakers, uh, so as not to roll the markets, is is to try to really only change you know a few things, a few meaningful things, uh, of course, but but to try to keep them quite static. So I would argue I haven't looked at it, but if one looked at the statements one can practically predict um, what, they're, you know, what they're going to say, uh, with the exception of a few key words, uh, just because of the um, uh, incredible dependence that goes, uh, goes in there. So, so I think during the uh, financial crisis, there was a, um, a, sustainment, or a statement about, uh, that, that stayed in the speech, as we documented in my earlier paper, but that stayed in, in the speech. There was a sentence that stayed there for you know, 92 consecutive statements. Uh, things like that. So in some ways, you could almost perfectly predict, of course, until the turning point happens and it disappears. Um, but so we haven't looked at that. In terms of the speeches, I think it would be difficult because, you know, so, so at some level, obviously, I've highlighted the key text features uh, that we can use to draw inference about some of these important questions. But it's important to remember that there's all kinds of text in there that isn't captured uh, by this. And in particular, you know, and that's one of the things that I think that was actually how this paper started based on um, the earlier work of my co-authors in thinking about you know, how much uh, do individuals, you know, how much individual at individuality comes into the speech. So you know, if, you have, if you know the speaker, I mean, in some ways it's, you know, is it captured by an individual specific fixed effect, or for instance, to try to predict um, what's in there. But there is, um, you know, in, in even using things like LDA, you can see that there's a lot of linguistic uh, heterogeneity that goes even within the same person from the same institution. So I, I'm a bit, um, I guess, I'm skeptical about whether we could actually like, you know, machine write a speech uh, that would at all match um, the, you know, the next speech of any particular reserve official. Uh, but in thinking about how likely are they to, to mirror or mimic certain themes, I think that we can uh, make some, mile, or, or make some progress on uh, in terms of prediction. Yeah, thank you, Robin, for a very uh, intriguing and uh, well-crafted uh, piece of work. A lot of computation and thought went, went, went into doing all this. Uh, I'd like to just come back to the, to, to the bigger picture that you outlaid in the first couple of slides. Uh, the Fed has a uh, statutory dual mandate of um, stable prices and low unemployment. And the financial stability, well, it can be viewed in two different ways. Given the mandate, it has a drive demand for financial stability, meaning that in order to maintain these two things uh, appropriately, we just have to have a very stable financial system. Or, conversely, you could view financial stability as kind of a temperature <laughs> uh, related to how good of a, you know, how, sort of a, a barometer of, of how good or bad it's doing on its dual mandate, meaning we can watch it and we could say that uh, uh, if we're not doing a good job of this stuff, all of a sudden now we have all these bank crises and that sort of stuff. So are you arguing that, I could see then why it would be, this financial would show up a lot in the speeches, but are you arguing that 
The Fed's actually trying to add a third leg to its mandate uh, de facto, or is it just embedded in its uh, original uh, dual mandate? No, so in that, some ways, a, I didn't quite get that. Yeah, but, in some ways, our first paper was looking at that. And, and part of that is because when you look at the speeches of, of Federal Reserve officials, there does seem to be a difference of opinion uh, regarding the extent to which financial stability is or has become uh, an actual part of the mandate. And, and you know, there, there seemed... Uh, back at the time that we did the first paper, there really was a bit of a distinction between uh, members of the Board of Governors and Reserve Bank officials. So, so some of the presidents from Reserve Banks uh, were much more explicit in saying that, that uh, there was this, you know, sort of de facto additional mandate. Uh, and so that was part of why we looked at that is, is because we didn't uh, uh, detect a consensus, even among the officials themselves, as to whether it should be in there. Um, I think it's, it's quite clear that it hasn't been officially added, uh, and, and one of the things that, that I, I think you know, we often forget uh, is that at the beginning of the Fed, it didn't have a dual mandate. The dual mandate was ad added in the 70s, um, and, and certainly other central banks like the ECB still have a single mandate, which is price stability. Um, and so, you know, in some ways, part of the interest in that question is the question of do we see um, you know, would there eventually be changes, for instance, to the Federal Reserve Act that would add a third, a, a, a ternary mandate in there? Um, we don't take a stance on that question as to whether it, it should or it shouldn't, uh, but that's the context in which the question we thought was interesting, um, is that there's, there has been an increasing discussion about financial stability. Um, I think there's been also increasing uh, pressure or attention on the Fed uh, to make sure that, you know, they, I mean, again, the central bank in a global financial crisis is, uh, you know, sort of the entity of last resort. And so certainly in a crisis situation, they're relied upon to uh, achieve or maintain financial stability. And so the question is, how much should they proactively be looking toward that in employing the tools uh, that they have at their disposal, you know, recognizing that actually, you know, the policy tools they have are, are quite blunt uh, instruments for something like that. So, so that's the context. So uh, very interesting. So um, I was wondering more about, uh, in, and very uh, reliable too, um, I was uh, wondering whether some of the results uh, wouldn't be expected in the following sense. Like you can write, usually write incomplete contracts, right? So for example, if the, uh, there is a low risk of uh, stabilization of the financial sector, then you're not going to mention that or, and of course, when the, the, the crisis came, the risk was pretty high and then people start worrying about this. So in other words, uh, it, it was implicit in the mandate that uh, um, you have to take care of financial stability, but since it never happened before or, or you know, for a long time, people didn't mention that at all. And then when it came, people start to mention that because it's kind of a, a necessary condition to fight, you know, to stabilize inflation. If you have uh, financial instability, you may have like bank runs and deflation or I don't know, chaos, complete chaos. So it's, it's like, a, a, like a goes without saying that financial stability is also uh, uh, in the mandate. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's interesting and, and struck us, you know, in, in the first paper that I did and then, and then in this as well, is you can see very clearly that financial stability has been on the radar screen for longer than, than just since the financial crisis. So I think uh, for a lot of us, and certainly for myself, um, I tend to think of it as a, oh, it, it suddenly, you know, rose to the forefront and prominence because of, uh, you know, the, the, the global financial crisis. But in fact, uh, you can see, at least through the text, that there, was dis there were discussions about financial stability concepts uh, well before that. Um, and, and so that was in, in some ways surprising. Now, at, at some level, it's also not surprising, at least uh, in the first paper that I did, I, I should have mentioned, we, it was only the Board of Governors uh, speeches. We didn't include the Reserve Bank presidents in that corpus. Um, and one of the things at the board is that uh, the Reserve Banks are responsible for bank supervision under delegated authority from the board. And so there is, for instance, a, a governor who is uh, sort of the governor in charge of, of bank supervision. Uh, and so, so you would expect basically one-seventh of the speeches to, to somehow reflect uh, 
um, things related to at least banking stability or, or stability of the banking system. That's different from financial stability, uh, but maybe it wasn't so surprising that there was that, that there were discussions even way back uh, when. And of course, you know, certainly when you go back to 1960, there were also there there have been earlier challenges to uh, the banking system or to financial stability that that caused this to be mentioned, whether in that phrase or not. I mean, that's I think that's the interesting thing about what. Um, about the, the algorithms we're using here is that it's less reliant on, on specific phrases. Um, it's, you know, it really looks at texts that, that bear similarities or that appear uh, you know, somewhat in conjunction with certain phrases. Uh, and so it's, it's very good at identifying themes that aren't necessarily associated with specific words. Thank you. Um, how do you judge the, uh, you know, validity of these methods? So, uh, anyway, how do you run a Monte Carlo analysis? And in practice, I mean, like, you know, we don't know the truth, so uh, what will be the ground truth, you know? Uh, will be an expert book on the, on the issues or, you know, I mean, like... Uh, yeah, good question. I mean, in, in some ways, this, this gets back a little bit to Andrew's question, right? So, so I mean, while I think it's not easy to predict an entire speech, uh, right? You know, one of the things, and particularly like the the, the masked um, modeling, where where you blank out certain words and then train the thing to predict those words. I mean, at some level, that you can run the horse race between the algorithm and humans, right? And just sort of see, you know, um, uh, empirically whether the algorithm does better at predicting what that missing word is, for instance, or what the next, you know, or whether two sentences come from the same speech uh, than a human. And so there are, um, there, there are stats or, or empirical findings related to that, uh, but that's how, that's how you measure whether the algorithm's doing well. Now, in, in terms of, I think the other part of your question is really the, okay, well, so, so fine, it can predict text or it, it can, you know, sort of match these textual features. How do we know that that's really, you know, if, if we say that, oh, future focus, you know, is, is really the key or, or is it associated with financial stability? How do we actually know that? Um, that's a harder question, um, but, but it's also one of those things that by using other corpora, um, using other speeches um, and, and thinking about these features, that's, you know, I mean, in some sense, that is what cosine similarity does or things like that. It's really identifying the, the extent to which these things show up uh, similarly. Um, it's not necessarily in a predictive uh, sense. I was wondering also whether you've looked at the dispersion of the topics and whether that's informative in any way, right? Because it's not clear to me that transparency necessarily is the best way to communicate in, 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 this, in this realm, right? So it'd be interesting also in looking at that. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, so, you know, at, at some level, we, it's, it's a bit tricky because, because we're not identifying topics in the classic sort of LDA uh, topic sense, but of course you can look at variation, uh, and that's one of the things that we're trying to do is, is look at variation, for instance, across Federal Reserve officials um, or across institutions. So, so it's uh, it's a feature that's in there. We haven't focused on it, but but certainly it's something that that we could do. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thanks again. Thank you.